hello, beautiful human. I am Zach, that is Dan, and we welcome to the studio for the first time ever. Uh, I mean, the best way to introduce you is counting crows. Is the headphones not working? Uh, it's going in and out of one ear. Of course <laughs> it is. Everything breaks around here. Yeah, dude. Our new studio is in the process of being made. You were over there in the green room. Nice. It's not bad over there, right? <laughs> it's nice over here. I was thinking of lying down. You can. Do whatever you want. All right, there you go. We're in? Yeah. Is it weird for people to know you really as your band and not as your individual self and being? No, I'd like to keep it that way. Why? I don't know. It just seemed like a good answer right then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, I t- okay, I take it back. No, I'm, I'm fine with it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it is the basis of most of my accomplishment in my life. So, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. I mean, can you just... What do you ask yourself why? Because like when you look back at your story from the very beginning, you manifested so much in the art you put out there and it became your reality. Have you asked yourself like what balances pure talent? What balances luck? What balances the universe and manifestation? I mean, nah, cause you can't really do much about it. I mean, oh, sorry. Let me turn this off. Nah. I don't know why it's on. You know, luck is, you need to get lucky in life. You know, otherwise a lot of things don't happen. There's no way, mo- you know, there's no way all of it is due to, like, skill or something like that. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of terrible music that people love. There's a lot of great music that people have never heard. So if the whole world's going to come together and decide that popular zeitgeist is we love you right now, that's great. But you can't depend on that. You know, so you're going to either get or not get luck. So... You know, since you can't do anything about that, you just try and be your best. You know, like, I just wanted to make really good records. Make great records where I loved every song on the record, where I was proud of every note. And then go play great concerts where, like, you show up every night and you just put it out there. You know, and the rest just sort of happens as it happens. There's not much you can do about You can't make the world come to your doorstep. Just if it does... You know, shrug and say that's great. You know, and, lucky. And, it, and it did for you. You ended up having like nine different record labels offer you a deal. Your biggest thing is creative control. So you have nobody's input, right? I'm assuming from Geffen. Oh, uh, no. I mean, we had some input, like helpful stuff, suggestions, like some really great art direction at times. People who helped us find video directors. We had input. We just didn't have control. They didn't have any control. Uh, although, you know, they, the truth is, you never really have full control. If they want to, they can find a way to push you. They can say, like, well, you can do it your way, but here are the consequences. But, you know, we stuck by our own things. You know, it was kind of great. They, they pretty much stuck by letting us, giving us the freedom. You know, and where we felt like they were wrong, we fought about it. You know, in the end, no one can really make you do anything. It's, people forget that in the entertainment industry because you get bullied a lot, you know, and but you can always say no. To anybody, you just have to live with the consequences. So, you know, I was willing to do that. When you look at, the, you mentioned the zeitgeist. Why did the zeitgeist come to you? I had no idea. You know, we were on the label. Uh, <coughs> DGC was a really indie label at the time. It was like Sonic Youth, The Sundays, The Posies, Teenage Fan Club, Us, Nirvana. A bunch of kind of weird college radio bands in the, all in their own different ways. You know, and... uh one year, all of a sudden, I, I mean, it, I should put this, did you see had a pretty smart attitude about it too? In, the, in my opinion, smart. They were just trying to get people's careers started. Sell a couple hundred thousand records maybe, which seems like a lot now, but wasn't then. And, you know, like REM did where they had six independent records before they really blew up, you know, but they got bigger every time. And that's kind of what DGC was set up to do. But Nirvana blows up through the sky with Nevermind, and then a year later or two years, whatever it was, we do too, you know, but I don't I don't think that was the recipe there. We were kind of all set up to be, you know, like newborn REMs kind of. And then it just, the whole world decided one year that Nirvana, and then the next year their label mates us. You know, like we knew all those guys. Uh, they were great. I was, they were really nice to me when I was just a guy making a record who'd never put out anything, you know, they were huge. And then we were huge, you know, it was just kind of happened. What was that energy like? Was it collaborative or 
were your peers siloed out and kind of isolating themselves from one another? No, it was pretty cool on the DGC side. It was almost like a summer camp in some ways. We'd hang out at the A&R guy's house. We'd all played on each other's records. Maria McKee was on the label, and my first thing I did was sing on her record. As soon as I got there, she was one of my heroes. I ended up singing on her record um, before we actually did the Counting Crows record or finished it. Um, yeah, it was kind of cool. I remember like going for barbecues with uh, Sonic Youth was there and, and uh, Maria's band and uh, you know Chris and Dave from... Uh, I don't remember if Kurt was there at the early barbecue stuff, but then I remember going to one at his manager's house and just hanging out with them. You know, we did kind of spend time around each other, not like all day yeah. every weekend, but you know, we were all introduced and people were pretty great. No, but I picture it now. Like if you're in like the pop circuit, at least like speaking from the pop side of things, you kind of know each other, you know, like if you're doing certain things and you're doing certain promo runs or whatever, you run into each other. You can build friendships. Yeah, it was weird for me, though, because I've never been, you know, once you get out of, you start off in, like, a scene in some town, like San Francisco for us, and you are part of a peer group. You, your friends are in other bands. You're playing in different bands together, you know. Uh, but then you get signed, and, you know, in the early days at Geffen, it was like I did know people. But then once it gets, once it kind of blows up or really starts to be a career, unless you're hanging out at the MTV Awards or the Grammys or something, you don't have that anymore. Like, I didn't know people after that for a long time until I started, like, an indie music festival of my own years ago. And now I got a peer group of musician friends again. But it was weird. I had it for a minute at the beginning with Geffen because everybody was that way. But then I sort of, you know, there is that, like you say, there's that pop scene where, you're at the award shows together, but I've never gone to any of them. I never liked going to those things, so I sort of skipped out on all of them and didn't really know anybody other than the bands I was, you know, touring with for a lot of years until the last, like, decade or so with the music festival. That's really interesting. I mean, you made that active decision to skip out on that shit. Yeah. It's boring. <laughs> it's really, really fucking boring, man. Those shows are boring and they're stupid. I mean, I know it's cool in a way. Like, I went to the Oscars. When we got nominated for an Oscar, that was just, like, yeah. too much of a circus to miss. I went to the Oscars. I went to the Golden Globes. Uh, but the rest of them, man, I grew up watching the Grammys. That shit is embarrassing. You know, like, I don't know what it's like anymore, but, like, is when I was a kid growing up, it was embarrassing. Like, they would give an award to anything. Um, but also, I don't really believe in the award thing. I don't know why we're like, I love music. I'm a music geek to the gills. But I don't need to decide who's best this year. I just love it, you know? And it always seems silly to me. I mean, we won some awards. I wasn't there for it. But I, I got a, I got one of the spacemen at home. Sick. Uh, never won a Grammy. Didn't win that goddamn Oscar. That really pissed me off. Did you want to win that one? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I was going to get my, brought my parents with me. I was going to go on their mantle, man. It would have been really cool. My mom and dad would have had an Oscar at their house. Instead, we lost, man. Did you Did you ever think writing a movie for Shrek, though, would get you nominated for an Oscar? I don't really think about it. I don't think I thought about it at the time. As soon as it started coming up in the conversation, it made sense to me, of course, because it's a huge movie. Oh, yeah. But you know what attracted me to it was that that shit is timeless, man. <laughs> Nothing in our culture lasts like... A, a really good kids movie like that. You know, I've said this a million times, but my grandmother saw Snow White and my mom saw Snow White and I saw Snow White. And if I have kids, they'll end up seeing Snow White. That stuff is timeless. Nothing in our culture lasts like that. So when I got approached for the Shrek thing, I said, I mean, absolutely. I went down to this t to DreamWorks, to Amblin Studios, Spielberg's place there. They showed me pretty much the whole movie with some storyboards for some sections. And, you know, I'd seen the first Shrek, so... It, it was great. You know, I thought, oh, this is going to be really good. Uh, my people my age will watch it. Kids will watch it. I mean, there are people who probably became Counting Crows fans because they saw oh. that movie when they were seven. Well, I mean, now yeah. they're 30. My you know? whole generation, all my peers, yeah. everybody, everybody I know, 100%. That was so cool. I mean, like, Disney songs from those Disney movies, Miles Davis ends up covering Someday My Prince Will Come. That stuff lasts forever and it crosses cultural barriers, it crosses mm -hmm. everything. It just seemed like this is the kind of thing, I mean, you want your stuff to be timeless. Is it fair know? to say that that could be your biggest song? I mean, uh, I don't Jones know. I mean, big. it was certainly, after 
for its time, it was. Huge. I don't know if it's bigger than around here, Mr. Jones, or Long December, but like it has a different life though. I think it has it a different is. audience too. It does because it's in that movie. Same thing for Colorblind, you know, in Cruel Intentions. Movies can be like you know. I remember being a kid watching The Graduate. I mean, not when it came out, but and thinking, man, Paul Simon really nailed this. This they got all this, all the music for this movie is him. That would be so cool to do. Um, I mean, with, the truth is what you realize later on is that movies are kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. Yeah, but like, it sure is cool having your music in them. What was your process like for Shrek? Um, I asked for a DVD of the the <laughs> opening like scene because, well, you know, it's, it's 2000, whatever that was, four, five. So, you, you know, you could get a little DVD to take home with you. So I, I asked for like the f- opening like 10 minutes of the movie so I could take it home with me and watch it and try and write something that worked to it. Um, and then I just worked on it for a while. How many sets of notes do you go through? Uh, what do you mean by notes? Like, does the studio give notes? <clears throat> no, they really liked the song. W- where we got into really collaborative stuff was when we went to record it. We were on tour, and we were in London, and we had, like, a three-day break. And we recorded the song. And then we were working with them, like, timed up with them in L.A. So we could send it. They could. They were showing it us over the screen so we could see it. Okay, it, it needs to be a little more gentle when it enters. Okay, what if we... I had an idea. Well, we do a cor- what are we do an acoustic intro? Because the version you hear the song now on the radio or something, it's not actually the version that's in the movie because the, in the movie we cut an, like an acoustic intro for it that's like the first verse is kind of quieter and acoustic because it needed to build up a little bit. So we worked with them like... For this one night, once we finished recording it, we spent hours... <clears throat> just adjusting some timing things so that beats would hit when visual beats hit on the film, which was really cool and interesting. It wasn't a bunch of notes about, like, we wish your song was better. They <laughs> love the song. But we we had to get it to fit the scene perfectly. And that was really cool and intense, kind of, because trying to get, like, you're orchestrating and conducting your band. What if we write an acoustic section here and then we'll transfer into the electric version of the song at this point? You know, we made it work. But it was us on the phone with the director in L.A. while we were in London. And uh, it was cool. That's I, actually, that, that part was kind of not a downer. Cause, you know, I know what you mean because notes can be a downer yeah. that way. But this was actually really cool because it was really collaborative and it was challenging and interesting. And the result is something that lasts forever. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Nothing like it. It's crazy, actually. I, you, I found this really interesting. You work at the Viper Room after your first album? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You do that to stay in touch with humanity or what? No. I do it to hang out at the Viper Room. Do you really? Yeah, man. I mean, I didn't really know many people in L.A., uh, but the only people I'd made friends with were kind of, I, the, some of the people, I don't remember how I first met them, but people that worked at the Viper Room, a couple of the bartenders, one of the barbacks, and uh, Sal Janko and Johnny Depp. You know, I, and I kind of become friends with them. I'd been on the road for about a year and a half, you know, on, on the first album. And when I got home, it was unlivable in the Bay Area. Like, there were kids camped out on my lawn, and it was an issue everywhere I went. I couldn't leave the house, and I couldn't even stay in the house because there were literally kids camped out on our lawn. And uh, But in L.A., there was nobody? No, I just don't think people cared. But, I mean, what happened was I was home. I had been home for six days. And I got a phone call. It was, like, the first week of January. Um... I think in 95 and it's Johnny Depp and Sal Janko calling and they start to ask, invite me to this party. And then finally Sal goes, wait, man, what is wrong? And I told him, you know, I was just having a really hard time. I was freaked out. I couldn't leave the house. They put me on hold. They came back about five minutes later. I didn't know what they were doing. And they said, okay, we got your reservation on the seven o'clock flight, Oakland to Burbank. Someone will pick you up at the airport we got you a room at the Bellage right behind the Viper. Uh, we were calling to invite you. It's Kate Moss's 21st birthday tonight. <laughs> we're having a party. We're closing the bar down. We want you to come down, but you got to get out of Berkeley. You got to get out and out. It's not healthy right now. So I, you know, I got on a plane and I went down there and I hung out. That night was kind of mind blowing for a guy that it like I hadn't been like a rock star for very long. And the entire time I had been, I'd been in a hotel or a bus. You know, I hadn't been like in Hollywood like this, you know, and it was crazy. Uh, but then I stayed at the Bellage for a few days and I went to, got a bungalow at the Sunset Marquee. Eventually 
uh, Shannon McManus, who was the bartender at the Viper, her friend rented me this cottage she had, and that became my first house down here. But I would hang out, I would hang out at the Viper every night because you know I didn't know anybody else, and it was just less crowded on that side of the bar because I could sit behind the bar with friends of mine. It gave me something to do. I'd make drinks or bartend sometimes, and I met all kinds of people. They come up and talk to me because I'm you know they're coming up to the bar anyways. Uh, and it was a really cool place to be. And at some point, like Shannon had to go to the bathroom or something. And she's like, can you handle the bar? I was like, yeah, I think I know how to work everything now. All right, I'll be back in a minute. She'd go to the bathroom. Or, and I ran, I'm running the cash register, and I'm making great tips for everybody. <laughs> like, I'm making huge tips. And I was just, it was the first time in a while I'd been comfortable. You know, because getting famous, man, that's like working up on waking up on Mars. The gravity is all different. You can get used to it, but it takes a while. You know, I, I just hadn't had a place where I was comfortable in a while. And I was just comfortable there. I knew everybody. I was like one of the guys. I just hang out in the office, or, you know, and there's, I didn't have to, it's not like a bar. I had to wander around mm. and meet people or say hi to anybody. I'm behind the bar. They're coming up to me anyways. I met all my friends. I met, you know, a lot of interesting famous people. I met Allen Ginsberg, hung out with Allen Ginsberg, <laughs> hung out with William Burroughs, hung out with Tom Petty, you know, hung out with Gibby Haynes from the Butthole Surfers. <laughs> to me, like, as a guy who was an English major, the Viper at that point was kind of what I imagined the left bank in Paris was in the 20s. It was like everybody was there. Everybody was really cool. Everybody was really interesting. Like musicians, filmmakers, poets, writers, Art painters, sculptors. It was just fucking crazy, man. How'd you meet Johnny Depp? You know, I can't remember. I was just trying to think of that the other day. I don't remember how I first met those guys at all. But I, I know that when I came down here, the only people I knew in L.A. were those guys. And I, I don't remember how I met Johnny. It might have been... I had met Sean Penn earlier and through him, uh, Robert Downey, but I think that was a little later. Um. Sean was before, but I think I met Robert afterwards. So I'm not sure how I met the guys at the Viper. It might have been just from them coming by gigs. You know, we played our first gigs in L.A. were all the Whiskey and the Roxy, which is, you know, pretty cool, right down the street from the Viper. So, And by the way, still today have that same sort of role within culture. You know, they're still housing a lot of artists as they yeah. make their way up. For now, until they build over and knock it down. It's happened. The it's Viper's nice. getting knocked down, isn't it? Yeah. Soon? I heard. That's not, really they sad. don't own it anymore anyways, but yeah, I mean, it was a really cool place for a while and it was just a real refuge, you know, like I, all my friends that I made, I lived here for 10 years after that, but I met everybody at the Viper Room, really. When, I you're, mean, when you're at the Viper Room with all these like musicians and rock stars or other famous people, do you feel like you belong? Because you, you, still, you still were kind of new to the whole scene. Yeah, everybody was really cool to me. I mean, uh. And, I, you know, I'm a pretty good guy in general. I just, I can be really shy. So it was good for me to be in a situation where I didn't have to be. I didn't have to worry about that so much. And I was so comfortable there, you know. And I just, I feel like I really bloomed in the Viper Room in a lot of ways just because I was so comfortable. I could be myself. And, man, I was, because I was really, really uncomfortable everywhere else. Getting famous, I just didn't know how to handle it. It was too weird having everybody look at me. I wasn't really built for that. Um, but the Viper Room kind of helped me transition and kind of helped me like, okay, I learned to be a rock star. It's not that nobody cares in LA. It's just that, man, Jack Nicholson's walking down the street, so who cared about me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Johnny Depp's in the office. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I felt like people appreciated me, but I wasn't getting hounded or anything. There's too many other interesting people. Was Mr. Jones really born out of this want to be a rock star? You really decided one day that you're going to be that? Well, I mean, kind of, but Marty Jones, Marty was the bass player in all the bands I was in before Counting Crows. Uh, and Marty's dad is like probably the only American to ever have a successful flamenco career in Madrid. He had, he had left years before and moved to Madrid, and he's a pretty famous flamenco guitar player over there for a long time. And at one point, he came back to visit America, and he was uh, played a bunch of shows in the Mission in San Francisco with his old flamenco troupe. So Marty and I, 
went over to watch one of the shows. It was, it was incredible. Like, and we went out afterwards with all like the flamenco players, you know, uh, and we all got wasted just <laughs> drinking at bar after bar across San Francisco that night. We ended up in this one bar called the New Amsterdam on Columbus, and it was really these you know hot flamenco dancers and like trying to talk to them and kind of getting some not ignored but like like we're kids we're Davy's son and his friend you know and there's some other girls in the bar and no one's paying much attention to us and I look over and in the corner I could see is Kenny Dale Johnson who was Chris Isaac's drummer. And Chris Isaac's band was this hot rockabilly band in the Bay Area at the time. They were, like, the biggest local band. And he's in the corner at this table with, like, three girls just hanging out. And I was like, <laughs> I said to Marty, man, we got to get our shit together because, like, we could, if we were famous rock stars, we could talk to girls. It would be, it would be cool, you know? And then I got home that night and I started thinking about that and also how silly it is. And because it's silly to think that, like, just getting famous is going to make everything good. But a lot of people believe that. It is true. So, I mean, I wrote the song, and it's really about dreaming about being a rock star, which is cool, but it's also about this is not going to turn out to be what you think it is. You know, when everybody loves you, he keeps saying, "I will never." when everybody loves me, I will never be lonely, which is not very realistic. So it's a song about both things, about dreaming, which is great, but also about how, like, look, nothing comes down from heaven, snaps its fingers, and makes the world a perfect place, you know? But you, at what stage in your life are you writing this? Like, because it kind of ends up coming to fruition, no? I know. <laughs> Makes me look pretty good right there. That's pretty <laughs> prescient stuff right there. Yeah, I mean, I was in I was in bands, but it wasn't like, what was going on in my career? Nothing. I was just in some bands. I didn't, I spent 10 years in the clubs, you know, struggling. And yeah, that song comes off really well later. Which makes it really cool to play now, too, because, like, the perspective I had when I wrote it is entirely different from the perspective, perspective I have now that I've lived it. You know, it's, like, I, it's really cool that way because I, it's got all these deeper textures. Has it changed? It hasn't really, but it, I just look at it differently. You know, I, there's... Maybe I can even appreciate more how great a dream it is to be a rock star because I've lived it for 30 years now. But I can also appreciate, really... Seriously, how it does not make the world a perfect place. It doesn't make you happy. It doesn't make you well adjusted. It doesn't change you from being a shy person. But it does mean you get to spend your life playing rock and roll. And that's just as cool as I thought it was when I started. It's really cool. You know, I mean, the people that do this with their lives, the chances of you could start a band, chances of you being good are pretty small. Chances of you making a great work of art, a great record, even smaller. But even if you do all that, chances of anybody caring, those are even smaller. And then you get all that. And the whole world rolls over and yawns at the thought of you two years later because that's what really happens. Even if every other thing falls in place, everybody gets bored and tired of you a year later. So to be here 30 years later, shit, I appreciate that. Yeah, That's really, really rare. And it's partially because we're really good, and it's partially because we're really lucky. And it's partially because we're really stubborn. You know, we're just not quitting, you know. But all those things are part of it, and they all come together in that song, you know, in a way that I recognize more every time I sing it, you know. How, how many times do you think you've performed that song over the years? Seven. Seven? I don't know. <laughs> well, the reason, like, do you get sick of it? Because I saw you guys in 2006. And of course, everyone's so excited for you guys to perform. And you played some like weird version of it, and I was like, "Are they sick?" I was like, mm. "But I'm, you know, I'm still thinking about it today." I'm like, I came to the concert, and I was like, they "Was it played... acoustic version of the song?" Like, I forget. It was more of just like a. It was just a different version. It wasn't the actual Mr. Jones. And I'm like, I wonder why they did that. Well, I think it's because we're still interested in it, okay. not because we're sick of it, but as much because we're still fascinated with it. And we're looking at different ways to play it and different ways to think about it. You know, there's a slower acoustic version that's a lot more about how the dream part of it is hollow and it doesn't turn out. And there are parts, there are electric versions that are much more about how fun it is to be a rock star. But like the song still provides interest, like even after all this time, you know, mm -hmm. which is kind of the opposite of being sick of it. Although like there are times when you're sick of almost every song. Mm -hmm. And so my solution is just don't play it that night. 
because I don't want to play something. I don't want to go. I don't want to hate the song. Yeah. Which if I was doing it over and over again on nights when I didn't want to, I might start to hate it. And I love that song. And so they're just nights where we don't play it. And I feel like that that fixes it. I think the most important thing is to show up on stage and be great every night. Mm-hmm. And and not phone it in because you're tired of a song. Um, and we have enough songs that it's okay to mm-hmm. skip it some nights. Like, there's no song except for A Long December that I want to play every night forever. For some reason, I'm never tired of A Long December. But every other song, there's been a night where I didn't want to play it. What's the difference? I do not know. I have no idea. For some reason, that one song, there's just never been a night where I didn't feel like playing it. And I couldn't tell you why. Because it's not true of anything else. But I always... I'm always happy to play A Long December. And I don't know why it is. What do you think of when you play it? It just feels perfect. Not that it's the best song I've ever written, but there's something perfect about that song. Something timeless about that song. Something forever about that song. It felt like when I wrote it, it felt like it wrote itself. That whole song was written and recorded in under 24 hours. Really? Yeah, man. I I was at the Viper Room. We were making uh, Recovering Satellites, and I was like, I gotten done in the studio. I was at the Viper till 2 or 3 in the morning. Went to my friend Samantha Matheson and Tracy Falco's house, which is, we used to call Hillside Manor, and was there till like three or four. Um, I think that night, Christian Slater was over the house and, and Jude Law, and I think we were all hanging out together till like four in the morning. And, uh, and then I went up the hill in Laurel Canyon to my place, and I got home, and I was like, hmm. And sat down, and I finished it by six in the morning, and then I went to sleep, and a friend of mine was in the hospital then, so I would go visit her in the hospital every day, like around lunchtime. And I was there till two or three in the afternoon, and I went to the studio around four or five. I taught it, I played it for the band before dinner, taught it to them after dinner, and then we started recording. And that's like take six, is oh. that song that that version on the record is like the sixth take. And that's it. There were no overdubs. I went back in. And said, run tape, and I sang one line of harmonies, and then I said, run it again, and I sang the other line of harmonies over the top of that. So there's three-part harmony at the end of the song. Uh, and that's it. There, There's no other overdubs on that song. It's just take six. What is a perfect song? How does it sound perfect? I don't know. It just feels like it halfway wrote itself. We knew how to play it right away. As soon as I played it for the guys, everybody knew what it should feel like. Mm. Just It just worked. It was like like sometimes things are just in your spine they're just in your genetic memory somewhere something that just you know that lizard brain shit that just communicates with you communicates with the band communicates with everybody who hears it and it just works that song just works are there any other songs that qualify not of mine i mean it just works i don't know i don't don't even mean it's my best song there's just something perfect about it that like feels like a gem you know, the way a, like a diamond looks. They're just cut the right... I don't know what I don't know how to describe it. It just feels like a perfect bit of craftsmanship that just naturally, no struggle, just kind of came out. You thought that recovering the satellites was lost in a fire, right? Or something? Well, it's been lost a bunch of different ways. Yeah, but you, you just ended up losing it. Well, I didn't lose it. I know, somebody misplaced it Geffen. or Geffen had like a big fire and like a bunch of things got Yeah, damaged. but bef- they'd already had a different excuse for how they lost recovering satellites before that. <laughs> they told us originally when we were trying to get some tracks for it and we were making this Desert Life, the next record, and they couldn't find them. And eventually they told us we mixed that record a few times. We couldn't get the mix right. We mixed it at the studio in New York with this guy, Matt Barbieri, I think. And there were too many tracks, and back then, if you had more than 24 tracks, you had to slave two machines together, which is a pain in the ass to do. So we copied all the tracks over onto digital and just mixed it on digital 48 track. Um, so they claimed they forgot to ever go back to the studio and pick up the 24 track, the original two-inch tapes. They just said they left them there, and that studio has long closed down. It was Steely Dan's old studio from the seventies and then this guy owned it and then it closed. So it doesn't exist anymore. And they just said, 
The record's gone. They just lost it. They had the f- digital tracks, but that meant they didn't have every. There were a bunch of stuff that we didn't mix that we didn't put on the record. That that was all gone. Then, years later, it turned out there had been this huge fire that they had denied existing for a while and, and then they <laughs> then they said no it was all lost in a fire and i said well i thought it was lost years before when you didn't pick up the tapes oh maybe but probably it was lost in the fire oh, geez. like okay so you had it until then uh we don't know so that goes on for years and years and then this you know this is starts starts in 1997 or so when we first <laughs> asked for the tapes and then just this last year uh, HBO is making a documentary on like surviving the first album and making recovering the satellites and Geffen just found everything. Damn. So it turned out maybe none of it was ever lost and none of it was ever burned up because they found almost all of it just last year. The truth is, and to sum it all up, they don't know where anything is. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea. You think the only thing that gives a record company value is actually the product they've made yeah. the records themselves. But they don't think of it that way because it's the last guy's job to make those records. And I'm working here now and I'm going to get fired soon. So whoever they got in charge of like the archives is like somebody's dumb son or something. I don't know. But like they don't know where anything is. And they just happen to find it now, though. Yeah, I can't explain it to you. They gave us 30 different excuses for why it was all lost, burned up, forgotten, destroyed. for Because this starts in 1997. So it's like 25 years <laughs> And then this year they found it all. I, You got me. I have no idea how to explain that away. Speaking of lost stuff, can you explain the fact that you hit a song on an album? Oh, yeah, we've done that a bunch of times. The, the one I'm talking about is your cover of Big Yellow Taxi. Oh, yeah, that one. That was more of a mistake than the others. I loved hiding songs on records because I think records are a specific, pristine thing. I want you to be able to put them on and listen from start to finish. And sometimes a song doesn't fit in the sequence. So I would just hide it. And like it's a it's like a an Easter egg. It's a present for the fan who forgets to turn off the record. And then it's there at the end. That's sick. I thought it was kind of a cool thing. I always thought we did it on several records, three or four different records. The only problem with the one on Big Yellow Taxi is that it really didn't fit on the record, but I loved it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I hit it at the end of the record. And the deal was with Geffen, it wasn't going to be a single for a year or more. We were like going to go through every other single on the record. And then when everything else was, you know, had gone through the radio, whatever it was going to do, we would reprint the record with it unhidden. And we had put Big Yellow Taxi out as a single because we thought it would be a hit. But then like, and they promised me, we're not going to put it out first or second. It'll be a year from now. So we have time to unhide it, you know, to reveal it. Because what happened is two weeks notice, the movie comes and says, hey, we really like that version of Big Yellow Taxi. You got hidden at the end of the song. We want to make it, we want to put it on in our movie. And we'll pay to make video for it. We'll make it a single. We'll promote it. Okay, great. Yeah, but your whole plan is shot. Yeah, and what happens is they put the song out. It's a massive hit. Yeah. But no one knows where it is. It didn't <laughs> sell any records. Because it was hidden. So people would come to the record store, and we got testimonials from record store owners back then who were like, yeah, people are coming in. They want some single you put out called Big Yellow Taxi, but all I have is this new hard candy record. And we're like, oh, man, this is a fucking disaster. <laughs> so it was a huge hit, and it didn't sell a single record. What was it like getting approval from Joni Mitchell? Oh, that was easy. You know, we were in, we were mixing, we were done kind of mixing, and I guess we were still finishing mixing in Ocean Way or what's it called now, cello. Um, and Joni was working down the hall. Sick. And we had done this acoustic hip-hop version of, not the version you heard, which is the remix of it, but we had this really acoustic with upright bass. It was an acoustic kind of hip-hop version of Big Yellow Taxi, and it was really cool. Uh, and so Steve Lillywhite, our producer, went down the hall one day and said, do you want to hear this? And Joni came down and sat with me and listened to it, and she loved it, and then she said, Hey, do you want to come listen to my new record? And I said, sure. And she was working on Travelog then, which was this uh, compilation of a bunch of her songs with the London Symphony Orchestra and like Wayne Shorter, Brian Blades playing on it. It was really cool. And I spent like two hours. She said, do you want to hear another one? Yes. So me and her just sat in this little mixing room at Ocean Way and talked about music and her life and the music business. And she played me pretty much the whole record. 
It was the coolest afternoon of my life, especially because I tried to sneak out. I was really nervous about meeting Joni. And so I tried to sneak out the back door. Steve said he was going to go get Joni. I was like, cool, I'll wait here. <laughs> he left. I went right out the back door of Ocean Way to try and get in my car and escape. I walked right out the back door and ran into Joni Mitchell, who was coming back from like walking her dog. <laughs> Just I got completely busted and I had to go back in and listen to the, the song with her. But worth it. Oh man, it was great. But I was really, you know, I I get really nervous around my idols. You know, and Joni, I mean, she's the real deal. No, oh, yeah. I was terrified. I was really I mean, I was on my way out the door. I was my car was right there. I, which I would never I wouldn't have had any of this experience, which is I'm glad I I got caught. But I got completely busted. I almost ran her over running out the door. I was in such a hurry. Can a cover be better than an original? Yeah, it's not though. <laughs> I love Johnny Mitchell, but I think it might be. I don't know. I love that cover. I mean, it, I'm sort of uh I think it's the cover of that original, but it's not you can't how you do that. Well, I mean, there are covers that are better than originals. Oh, yeah, Michael Bolton has done it a couple times. Yeah, I'm not sure that he's are better. Come on. Uh, come on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> do I have to do that scene for Office Space for you? Um, no, no, I'm more part of Michael Bolton. I have nothing against him. Um, but, like, uh, now I'm spacing on trying to think of. Uh, I'll tell you one. You Ain't Going Nowhere on Sweetheart of the Rodeo, the Birds cover of Dylan, is better than the Basement Tapes version. And the Basement Tape version is great. But that Birds version is out of this world. So good. I will listen. How did you get Vanessa Carlton on there? Like, where'd she come from? Mm. Well, we were looking to try and do a remix of the song because I like the idea of like finding some hip hop producers or somebody to like take one of our songs and mash it up and talk to Pharrell at the time and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis from the time, and who were also really big producers right then. They'd just done all the Janet Jackson records. Um, oh, wait, she sampled that. Didn't she sample? Janet she, Jackson she sampled She did do a something. sample of Big Yellow Taxi, yeah. something else later. That's right. I don't remember what it was, though. Look that up. But, um, man, that, that's going to drive me crazy. But uh, we had to leave the country right after that. We were starting, We had our tour in Europe started about a few months before the record was coming out. So we had to leave to go on tour, and we were having trouble getting someone to do it. Pharrell's thing didn't work very well. This is before he was Pharrell, like... He was just, he was, well, not, he was, he was in the Neptunes. He was a producer, but even before the Neptunes put out the Neptunes record, I, I just thought he was the best producer alive. Um, and Ron Fair, who was, uh, who produced Vanessa's record and was also like an A&R guy at Geffen then called me and said, I've got a version of this. I, I hear you guys are trying to do a remix of uh, Big Yellow Taxi. I don't want you to be angry, but I did one. Cause I, you know, I, can I send it to you? See if you want to hear it. I said, sure. You know, he sent it and I thought it was really good. He'd done a great job, you know? And, uh, I called him back. I said, this is actually great. We should just use this. This is fantastic. He said, okay. You know, and, uh, we were getting ready to leave on tour and we had to go to London. He was going to put the vocal, get a woman to sing on it. Cause we wanted someone to do those bop bops. Um, and then he was going to meet us over in London and we were going to do a few days of recording to add some more tracks to it. Um, and we were trying to figure out who to do it with. We were thinking about Nora Jones. But so good. when we were mixing that record, like when Joni was stopping by, um, Jack Joseph Puig had just mixed Vanessa Carlton's record right before he was mixing Hard Candy. Um, and I had heard a bunch of stuff from it because he played me. He said, this girl's really good. You should hear some. He played me some of the songs. And I thought they were great. Um, I'm not even sure it was out yet at this point. I mean, it definitely wasn't out when I heard the songs because they had just finished mixing it the week before we went in the studio. Um, and Ron was trying to figure out who would be a good person to come in and sing on it. And I said, why don't you use that girl, Vanessa? Because I was thinking that somebody coming in to sing on one of our records when I'm not there is going to be really intimidated. And I won't be there to say, no, let go, just sing. You don't have to like sing perfect. I want you to vamp and go off, you know? I thought people were going to be pretty nervous about doing that. But this girl had just made a record with, with Ron. The producer, yeah. So she'd be comfortable with him in the studio. That's sick. Um, so I said, why don't you use her? She's great. You know, I mean, I didn't think she was going to be Vanessa Carlton as she turned <laughs> out to be. I just thought she was really good. 
and she'd be comfortable with him. And if I couldn't be there, I really wanted someone who was comfortable with him. And she did a great job. And then it's just like dumb luck because she turns out to be Vanessa Carlton. I Although think she the, put out like a thousand miles shortly after Big Yellow Taxi came out. It could maybe have been even too, a little bit before. I can't okay. remember. But it was definitely, it was done before we recorded it. Like mm. it wasn't out before we recorded it though because I'm pretty sure no one knew who she was because I remember like a couple people were kind of like, why are you having this girl <laughs> do it when you could get, you know, a list of famous people. I mean, Cheryl had Cheryl Crow had sung on the record. So they were like, why don't you just get Cheryl? Why don't you get Nora Jones? And I was like, I, I don't want to end it. I'm not going to be there. Yeah, I didn't want, I you know, honestly. And I also thought she was really good. You know, I didn't, you know, I was, I, I'd be lying if I said I knew she was going to be like a huge star or something. But, but The right decision. Yeah. I mean, she turned out, she did great. Mm-hmm. By the way, you can listen to all of Counting Crow's discography. It's available for you on Amazon Music, including Butter Miracle, Sweet One. Uh, that was supposed to be first of two EPs, right? But we only got one. Well, it wasn't really. It was just supposed to be this idea I had for making a suite. Um, I only conceived of it as one thing because I didn't even know if it would work. You know, trying to do four songs that flow like that, I wasn't sure it was going to work at all. Until we finished it, I really wasn't sure. Until I've never made a record like that where you don't know all the way to the end if it's any good. Because Really? Yeah, because most records aren't dependent on how they flow. I mean, yeah. the, the sequence matters, but not... Yeah, it was just... It was really weird. And I'm maybe the most satisfying moment of my career. When we finished mixing it and we snipped those four songs together and they worked. I mean, I was so excited. It was mind blowing. It was the coolest moment in my career almost. Um, but yeah, working on Sweet Two. Sick. I had it almost done. I was in England. I had written the second suite. I thought it was finished. Uh, I was on my friend's farm and I left to come home. I stopped in London on the way there, and I sang on my friend's uh, record, this band Gang of Youth, Australian band. Oh, yeah. Um, and when I got home, about a month later, Dave Leo Pepe, the singer, lead singer, sent me the finished record. And, and man, this is the only time this has ever happened in my entire career. It was so good that I thought, now nah, these songs aren't good enough. I got to rework some of the stuff I wrote. This is not, they're, they're not at that level. So, I, an- another group pushed you. It's never happened before. I've never had a moment's doubt in anything I'd ever written. But I just thought, "Mm, these songs could be better. Wow. Yeah. You scrap them and start from scratch? or do you? No, not from scratch. I'm keeping like half of it. Okay. Yeah. But Sweet 2 is coming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I would like to maybe record it. We've just been touring so much. We were in Europe all through the fall last year. We just got back from Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Damn. And then uh, we're going out in a couple days for four straight months till the end of September. I was hoping we'd get in the studio maybe in the fall, but now we're talking about South America in the fall. So um, we'll see. It'd be lo- I'd love to get in and record in the fall, but it depends how much touring we're going to do because we need some time to work on the record. So. I don't know how much time off we're going to have between uh, the American tour and if we go to South America. So we'll see. It's crazy that there's still such a massive appetite. Um. Yeah. I mean, well, also we had a couple years away from it. So we're really, you know. Yeah, the hype was rebuilt. Yeah. I mean, we want, don't want to take too much time off right now because we just had two years of time off. So um, the pandemic was kind of a pain. That's the longest I've gone without playing a show since I was a kid. I've never gone two years without playing a show. Since I was a teenager, like it's weird. That was that was Scary. bizarre. Yeah, I don't need to go through another pandemic. <laughs> nah. By the way, if you want to see uh, Counting Crows on the road, link in the description below. Also, again, all their music is on Amazon Music. W- what are you thinking? You're touring with Dashboard. How how did you guys come together? I wasn't expecting to see that. Oh man, I've been trying to get this tour for twenty years. Really? No joke. At least twenty years. Um, Chris is one of my best friends. Um, we send each other music back and forth when we're working on new music. He's like, uh, he came and stayed with us last weekend and I, I got tickets for all of us. So we went to Taylor Swift. <laughs> like, Sick. Yeah. Um, he, he's just, uh, we met years ago. Uh, we were both playing Neil Young's uh, bridge concert, the acoustic benefit he does in San Francisco. We were both on the s- same bill and we met that day. We were fans of each other because um, I guess he was really influenced by Recovering the Satellites, which Gil Norton produced. Uh, and Gil had done all the Pixies records before that. And so 
he had Gil produce a Mark Emission, a brand of Scar, the album with Hands Down on it. So as soon as that came out, I was like, oh, this is Gil. You know, I wanted to see the record Gil had done. Uh, it was just like I, those years after that, he did that great Foo Fighters record and uh, he did Dashboard record. So I was a fan right away. We didn't become really good friends until Chris was making Dusk and Summer and he asked me to come sing on it with him. So I'm, we did like a duet on that song, So Long, So Long. Um, but we've been really good friends ever since then. Working in the studio with someone is a good way to bond. Oh you know, yeah, it's like you really know, especially when you're a musician, you really see who pulls up to the curb with the goods, you know, like because it's you know you're in front of your peers and you you got to not suck at that moment. <laughs> you also got to feel vulnerable and safe to share and both, you know. But you also like, man, you know, I want to be good, right? Uh -huh. And when, I, he sent me the the demo for that song and asked me if I would sing on it, and I got to tell you, my first response was, this song does i would love to be on this song this song does not need me it was so good he had all these background vocals he'd already done that were so good like i, I at first i was like i i tell him honestly i i don't actually think it needs i'd be happy to do it i don't actually think it needs me at all and see what i come up with and i went in there and actually came up with a bunch of stuff that wasn't on there that actually i think is really good and, and makes the song really good but his demo was so good that i really thought he was making a mistake putting me on it because he sounded so good on it, you know. But yeah, it, it's a basis of a great friendship now for all these years after that. It's really special. Yeah. You good? Yeah. He's got to go. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I'm fine. Adam, Counting Crows. Please listen to all of Counting Crows' music, entire discography on Amazon Music. I appreciate you giving us your time and energy oh, today, man. man. Thanks, you guys. It's oh. uh, nice that people still give a shit. No, we definitely give a shit. Yeah. Thanks for hanging. I, yeah, but, I mean, I was, I grew up listening to you with my parents and like, I just had no idea about half a lot of the shit you were just talking about, like all the connections you had and people you knew and the way you came up in the, it's crazy. very interesting. Got to learn to tell those stories. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, really, it goes a long way. I promise you. Yeah, so, man. Thank you guys. Thanks for sharing. It's actually a really nice interview. Huh? Yeah. I've had good interviews all day today. It's weird. Fuck yeah. Not every day is like that. <laughs> Counting crows, everybody. Woo. Thanks y'all. <laughs>